Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Cleveland Clinic CEO and President, Dr. Toby Cosgrove. Well, good afternoon and welcome. I don't think we could probably have a more timely topic nor a better speaker uh, for this topic than Admiral uh, Michael Rogers. The National Security Agency is part of the Defense Department. Its job is to monitor, collect, and process information necessary for the defense of our country. The NSA, as it's usually called, includes the United States Cyber Command and the Central Security Service. The Cyber Command protects the United States and its allies from internet-based attacks. The Central Security Service integrates the work of the NSA with the code activities of the armed forces. These agencies employ tens of thousands of military and civilian personnel. Each plays a critical role in the defense of our nation. All three are led by one man, Admiral Michael Rogers. Admiral Rogers was born in Chicago, attended Auburn University, and he claims that in high school he was terrible at math. But from an early age, he was drawn to cryptology, the study of codes. Rogers entered the Reserve Officers Training Corps at Auburn and graduated in the Navy. He served as a surface warfare officer for six years. But the Navy spotted his talents for codes and he received officers' appointments in information warfare and cryptology. He led crypto cryptographic missions aboard submarines and surface units in the Arabian Gulf and Mediterranean. Over the years, he's earned positions of increasing responsibility ashore and afloat. In 2007, he became intelligence officer of the U.S. Pacific Command, and two years later, intelligence director of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. His most recent post was Fleet Cyber Command, the Navy's Cyber Warfare and Electronics Intelligence Unit. He and, and the fleet sometimes fought off hundreds of cyber attacks a day. Admiral Roughhead, former commander of the U.S. Pacific Fleet, calls him the best in the business. Admiral Rogers is known for his work to work 14 to 15 hours a day. His grandfather was a coal miner in Wales. His father worked four jobs and taught his sons that hard work was the greatest gift. In high school, he enjoyed performing arts and broadcasting. He's been married to his wife, Dana, for 29 years. They have a son in the Navy and one in college. He's a lifelong fan of Auburn football. The New York Times describes Admiral Rogers' three current posts as one of the most powerful job combinations in Washington. Here's a video that will tell you a little bit more about him. Greetings, Professor Holcomb. A generation ago, cyberspace was just a term from science fiction, and wars were fought against an enemy that we could see. Today, our everyday lives, from commerce to communication, revolve around the internet, and that has made us vulnerable. Target hacked. Millions of people could be at risk. It's the hack heard and seen around the world. Keeping us safe requires a new kind of soldier and a new kind of leader. President Obama has chosen Vice Admiral Michael Rogers to be the next director of the National Security Agency and head of U.S. Cyber Command. Born in Chicago, Admiral Rogers learned the value of hard work from his father. At a young age, he knew he wanted to be in the Navy. He joined the Reserve Officers Training Corps program at Auburn University and became a surface warfare officer after graduation. It was Admiral Rogers' redesignation to cryptology a few years later that launched his career in intelligence. He worked his way up the ranks, eventually serving as Director of Intelligence for the Joint Chiefs of Staff and then head of the U.S. 10th Fleet and Fleet Cyber Command, the Navy's Cyber Warfare Force. There, he and his officers, whom he often referred to as Jedi Knights, fought off hundreds of probes or cyber attacks a day. It was a unique command that merged traditional military operations with cutting-edge technology. This career path has made him singularly qualified to face the challenges ahead. Cyber is the ultimate team sport. There is not one single entity that has all the answers. There is not one single technology that is going to solve this problem set. 
working with business, political, and military leaders. One of Admiral Rogers' missions is to defend our critical infrastructure against an unseen enemy. It's now clear this cyber threat is one of the most serious economic and national security challenges we face as a nation. Balancing on the tight wire of personal privacy and the public good. Cyber crime, cyber hacking is growing and people want to be able to protect the information on their electronic devices. Admiral Michael Rogers is tasked with creating the cyber warriors of a new generation, a workforce of thousands of men and women working behind a computer screen instead of the helm of a battleship, using technology and advanced intelligence to serve and protect as we sail uncharted waters into a new era of national security. Please join me in welcoming Admiral Michael Rogers. Thanks, Toby. That is amazing. Thank you. Well, I have to tell you, that's the most well-researched introduction I, <laughs> I have ever experienced in my career as a naval officer. So, first and foremost, good afternoon, and thank you very much for your willingness to spend some time and talking about some topics that I think are very important to us as a nation. Um, I'll talk for a little bit, and then I'm willing to take any question on any topic from anybody. So first, as you heard uh, Toby mention, I have two, three job titles, but two primary ones. As the director of the National Security Agency, NSA has two primary missions. Um, the first one, foreign intelligence, is the one that, quite frankly, over the course of the last two years, has tended to get the most attention. In that mission, NSA is tasked with using our signals intelligence abilities, that's our ability to penetrate opponent communications, their radar systems, their electronic computer to computer communications, to attempt to generate insights as to what nation states, groups, and individuals around the world are doing that is of concern to us as a nation and us as individuals. The second job for NSA is becoming increasingly important, and that's NSA has a primary mission in information assurance or computer security, computer network defense. Traditionally, NSA was tasked with helping the Department of Defense generate um, our classified standards for the protections of our systems. Increasingly, in the last few years, we've been asked to expand that work beyond just the Department of Defense to until a few years ago, the government, and now in the world we're living in, um, quite frankly, now it's partnering with Department of Homeland Security, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, working in the private sector. So there hasn't been a major hack really in the commercial sector in the last year or so that ultimately we haven't been called in to partner with others to use our analytic capabilities to try to understand who did it, how did it happen, and then how do we defend against it and what kind of changes do we need to make. So from Sony to the OPM issue we're dealing with right now, the National Security Agency has been a part of the broader government effort to attempt to deal with those challenges. At the same time, I am also the commander of United States Cyber Command, which between the two jobs is actually the more senior of the two. United States Cyber Command has three primary missions in the Department of Defense to defend the Department of Defense's network. So the Department of Defense, big organization, multiple millions of people and users, spans the globe, just like many private entities do. Um, we work at multiple classification levels. We work from fixed locations. We work from mobile units. We work from expeditionary um, kind of structures in Afghanistan and Iraq, and we're tasked with generating the network structure and protecting it across that entire spectrum. Um, in fact, we run the largest internet in the world, for example. Um, so, so I'm like some of you in this audience, hey, I'm tasked with defending the networks of a particular entity, in this case, the Department of Defense. The second mission that U.S. Cyber Command is tasked with is the Department of Defense has made a commitment the idea that given what's going on in the world around us, the nation needs a dedicated cyber mission force of men and women. There's about 6,200 when we finish the build out that will be broken down into about a set of 133 different teams with different functions. But this, set, this dedicated cyber mission force will be tasked with operating both the defensive to the offensive side of cyber for the Department of Defense. And my task in that area, my second mission, is to generate that force and then um, be the primary driver in how, is it, how it is employed or used 
in the defense of the nation. The third mission um, for U.S. Cyber Command is if directed by the President or the Secretary of Defense, it is to apply our capabilities to help defend critical infrastructure in the United States in the private sector. The United States government has designated 16 different segments in the private sector as having significant implications for the nation's security. So think about financial, think about power, think about aviation, um, think about petroleum distribution. There's 16 different segments. And so part of our third and final mission is to be ready um, if we're tasked to do so to help defend that infrastructure. So I find myself in these two jobs at a crossroads of cyber and signals intelligence. And then the reason we kind of opted by design to bring these together is that we were finding in the world of signals intelligence that the communications of the world were going into the network. And as a result of that, we made the decision that cyber and SIGINT were so closely interrelated that we needed to bring these capabilities together to different organizations with different missions but related missions. And so we decided we needed to bring these organizations together under one commander. And I am the second individual to have this job. NSA is an organization that is approximately 62 years old. U.S. Cyber Command is an organization that is only five years old. So the cyber piece is much newer, much less mature. So as a leader, I find myself, I'm trying, we, the team that I'm a part of, on the U.S. Cyber Command side, we are trying to create something new. We're trying to build something that positions us for the future. And the challenge in trying to do that is, quite frankly, we're in essence trying to fly the airplane at the same time we're trying to build it. Because there is so much activity ongoing, as I remind the, the Secretary of Defense, as I talk to the chairman, as I talk to the other senior commanders within the department, we do not have the time to say, look, give me five years, let me build this out, and then we'll be ready to go. That's just not going to work, what's going on in the world around us. So increasingly, I find myself, as I'm bringing capacity, as we're bringing capability online, we've got to apply it immediately in a way that, quite frankly, is unusual in the military. The idea, for example, that we would take a fighter squadron or a carrier strike group and deploy it as soon as it came out of the shipyard or as soon as it got its airplanes, we, never, we would never do anything else that way. But we're having to do that in cyber because we just don't have the luxury of time. It's an interesting leadership challenge for me. How do you train, how do you build, how do you sustain? And it's not unique to us, all of us, in the end, I've always believed no matter what you do, it's the human dimension that drives your success. And so we find ourselves trying to figure out, so how do you optimize a workforce for today and tomorrow? And how do you do it? At the same time you're creating it, you are employing it as if it was fully trained and ready to go. Um, I find that to be a rather invigorating leadership challenge at times, to be honest. Um, <laughs> On the NSA side, um, you know, clearly a lot of um, discussion over the last couple of years, much of it from my perspective, very frustrating in the sense that it's inaccurate um, about what's the role of NSA, what is it doing. What I try to remind people is, number one, NSA, the National Security Agency, is a foreign intelligence organization. We do not do domestic surveillance. That is illegal. We do not do domestic surveillance. To do any collection outside the United States against a US person, I gotta go to a judge. We have to legally go to a court, the FISA court, and I have to make a case, we have to make a case, that that US person is acting as an agent of a foreign government, or they are operating in one of about six defined categories. They are proliferating weapons of mass destruction. They're involved in international terrorism. They're involved in actions against US forces or US computer systems. They're involved in um, transnational crime. I have to show a judge that there's one of about six categories that this individual fits in. That's the only way we can collect against a US person outside the United States. And in the United States, it is illegal for us to collect against a U.S. person because we are a foreign intelligence organization. Now, you wouldn't get that based on much of what I've read in the last two years where I just scratch my head going, what are we talking about? Do you know what the laws are? Um, you know, we've seen some, uh, the, the biggest thing initially that came out in all of this was the whole idea of, some of you have heard about this whole idea of the telephone metadata. 
where in the aftermath of 9-11, one of the hijackers was a known Al-Qaeda associate who had entered in the United States and we weren't aware of it. And while he was undergoing his aviation training in San Diego, he was calling back to a known Al-Qaeda affiliated location in Yemen. We, we got the Yemen side of the conversation. We didn't get the domestic side of the conversation. Quite frankly, we didn't realize it was originating from the United States. Because had we realized it was originating from the United States, it would have immediately set off alarm bells for us. What is this guy doing in the continental United States? Um, again, quite frankly, we weren't doing anything like this at the time. But in the aftermath of 9-11, the whole idea was, is there a way to create a mechanism where we can look to see, are there connections between activity that we're seeing overseas, between known terrorist associates and individuals in the United States? That was the whole premise behind, well, why does NSA want to access this data? So don't get me wrong, you can certainly agree or disagree. My only comment is, please don't think for one minute that this wasn't a thought out purpose with a rationale behind it. Because again, at times, it comes across, well, we would just do things because we can do it. That is not an accurate description. There's always a reason. Um, over the course of the last few months, in fact, I, I think many of you are aware, the legal authority that we used to do that, again, under the law, um, was Section 215 of the Patriot Act, which the government interpreted as giving us the authority to go to the FISA court. We went to the court, which is located in Northern Virginia, Using the law, what the court then authorized was several of the largest phone providers in the United States. Um, every 90 days or so, they renewed the order, and the court order said that the largest phone companies in the United States had to provide NSA with the following information. Date a phone call originated, number the call originated from, number the call went to, duration of the call. What was not in that? No names, no geographic locations, no content. I have n had no clue who was on the phone. I couldn't tell you exactly where the phone call originated from, and I couldn't tell you who was on the phone. All we got were numbers. As a result of the media revelations, um, as some of you may remember, in January of 2014, the President of the United States made uh, an address to the nation in which he said, I'm aware of the revelations that you've seen in the media. I've taken a review of the National Security Agency, and I am comfortable that NSA is not, is not violating the law, attempting to systematically undermine the privacy or rights of our citizens, or abusing the authority that's been granted to it. But, and this is the second part that he said, I am mindful of the potential for abuse, and therefore he directed the following additional change. What we had been doing prior to the president's remarks were we would ingest the phone data, we kept it in a separate database. For example, NSA is an organization uh, that numbers in the tens of thousands. As of 10 days ago, 34 people had access to that data. We really ratcheted this down. Because again, concerned about if employees just decide, hey, look, I'm just going to check and see if my phone number is in there. Um, and then we put a series of controls into the database. So for example, in the run up to the congressional discussion we've had in the last couple of months, and I'll talk about that in a minute, um, as a test one day, I walked down to the area that we actually do this in, and I directed the team, I want you to put my personal cell phone number into the system, and I want you to tell me what kicks out. And what immediately kicked out was, we are not authorized to query against this number because we don't have a court order. I couldn't trick the system. And I'm the director. Um, so what the president directed in January was, so I want to put one more level of protection in. I acknowledge that you have limited this to an incredibly small number of people. I acknowledge at the time we actually had created a standard. We called it reasonable articulable suspicion. We had to come up, we had to meet a threshold for us to even access the data. The president said, I want to take it a step further. I want you to use that same standard, we call this the reasonable articulable suspicion. 
I want you to take that same standard and instead of you, Admiral Rogers, deciding that you've met the standard, I want you to go to the court and I want you to make the judge agree that you've met that standard. And so starting in January 14, we added one more layer to this. In order for any of us at NSA, any of those 34 people, to actually access the data, we had to go to the judge and we get it, had to get the judge to grant us an order to give us permission. So an interesting, we got the judge to grant us permission to get the data in the first place, but then we put another level of control and said to actually access the data or even look at it, you gotta go back to the judge and give you permission for a specific number. Um, and then there's two, when we go to the judge, there's two standards that we have to meet under this process. Number one, I have to tie a phone number, a selector, if you will, to a specific individual. I can't just say, for example, hey, we think there's a terrorist effort ongoing out of Los Angeles. Will you let me query every phone number that's got an LA-based area code? Can't do it. It's gotta be a specific number attached to a specific individual. And the second thing that we have to prove to the judge is, and there's a connection between this individual and a terrorist group. So there's two elements to this, to get the judge to say yes for us to access the data. Again, you wouldn't have a clue about any of that based on the discussion over the last 18 months. Um, and so uh, the Patriot Act expired May 31st of this year, less than uh, 30 days ago. And so some of you may remember congressional debate, because again, it's a legal framework. Laws are written by our Congress. Um, the job of NSA is to apply the law, not to write it. I always remind our workforce, remember what our role is. We obey the rule of law. When we make a mistake, we stand up and we publicly acknowledge we made a mistake. Um, and the, the two other things I tell the workforce is, remember, we remain accountable to the citizens of the nation we defend. And number three, or number four, and finally, there's a difference between a mistake and a choice. If you make a mistake, the question I'll ask you is, so did we fail to train you correctly? Did we fail to articulate what our expectations and our standards were? Did we fail to put a technical solution in place that worked the way we designed it? If the answer to those things are, yeah, we didn't train you enough, we did not, I say, okay, that's bad on the organization, or you didn't just know and you made a mistake. But if you choose to consciously override the legal framework the policy we use, the protections we've put in place, the training we've given you, the technical safeguards we've put in place. If you choose to override any of those things, ladies and gentlemen, that's not a mistake, that's a choice. And what I have told the workforce of the National Security Agency is, and I will hold you accountable for the choice you make, just as I expect to be held accountable as the director for the choices that I make. Because um, I think accountability is an important part of our responsibility to the nation. Our citizens have to believe that the National Security Agency is an organization that obeys the law, that follows a legal and a policy framework, and that it's accountable to the citizens of the nation that we defend. That's something I truly believe. Because like many of you here, I remember the 1960s and the 1970s when I was a kid at the time. But I can remember how historically elements within the intelligence community were used to assess Americans' views on the war in Vietnam, political affiliations, things that we look at now and go, how would we ever have done that? I remember that, and I will have no part of that. That's not the oath I took as a commissioned officer, to defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and to bear true faith and allegiance to the same. I believe strongly in that legal basis for what we do. It has powered us as a nation for over 235 years, it's created a model that I think in many ways is the envy of the rest of the world. It has been incredibly good for us, and I don't want to throw that away. Um, so, much debate, but um, on, after the act expired on the 31st of May, a couple days later, Congress passed and the president signed into law a follow-on to the Patriot Act, in which we have basically taken the process we use now and made one further change. And the change that the new law that has been signed into effect does is it says, NSA, we want you to use the same standard. We want you to go to the judge just like you were doing. But the biggest difference is we don't want you to hold the data. We'll have the phone companies hold the data. So we're in the midst. There's a legal challenge ongoing at the moment. It'll be resolved relatively soon, I suspect. And when it's resolved, um, uh, assuming it concurs in the legality of the law, which I believe it will, but again, I'm not a lawyer, um, 
will then work with the pro phone providers to work through how we're going to do this. And they will retain the data. We'll go to the judge. We'll give the judge a reason for, again, individual tied to a specific number, individual tied to a group. And then once the judge gives us permission, then we'll go to the phone companies and we'll say, I need to see all the phone activity you have associated with this number. And the phone companies will provide us the data. And we'll do all the analytic work. The, the reason I highlight that to you is when it's all said and done, the thing that I thought was very powerful was that our elected representatives ultimately decided that there was value in the capability and that we could make some changes that would engender increased confidence. The whole idea was allow us to access the capability to generate insights to help defend the nation, but do it in a way that helps increase the confidence of our citizens that this information is not being used maliciously or for some other purpose other than that which is explicitly directed in the law. Um, so it's something I'm very committed to. It's something the organization is committed to. NSA has had multiple reviews in the aftermath of the media revelations, and every one of, his, of them has come back with the same thing. NSA is following the law. NSA is fully compliant with policy, and NSA actually has a very rigorous compliance structure internally. Um, it's something that's really amazing. I was just talking to our team on, at the midday before I flew here. Um, I was talking to the team about, so what are the, some of the things we need to think about in the future? And what I reminded them was, if you go back in 2009, the FISA court came back to NSA and said, hey, look, we have some concerns about the way you are doing business that suggest to us that you have some systematic issues. And my predecessor back, predecessor back in 2009 sat down and said, OK, we've got to step back and ask ourselves, what are the changes we need to make to engender increased confidence on the part of the court as we're executing our mission? In the course of the five or six years since then, NSA has put an amazing internal structure in place about how we control access to sensitive data like the phone data that we hold. Um, and I would point out to everybody, there has yet to be any suggestion that we have knowingly abused this phone information against anyone. We're just not going to do that, both because it is illegal, because it is morally wrong, and also because we put a lot of measures in place, quite frankly, to make sure that you can't do it. Um, on the U.S. Cyber Command side, I know I find myself at a nexus now of not only how, you, how do you defend DOD systems, but as a society, more broadly, as we are looking at, so how are we going to deal in a world in which nation states, groups, and individuals have decided that there is apparently, to date at least, there is not a significant price to pay for some pretty aggressive actions, whether that's the theft of intellectual property, whether that's the theft of research and development work, whether that's the theft of massive amounts of personal inf identifiable information, we now live in a world where data is a commodity. And there are actors out there who believe that commodity has value. And so they're interested in breaking into systems in which large amounts of data resides. And it's one of the areas, for many of you in the medical profession, it is one of the areas that really concerns me. Because when I look at, so where is the greatest concentration of personally identifiable information across our structures? Medicine is one area that just jumps out at you. You look at the data that all of us have willingly given to our medical teammates. I mean, ourselves, our families, <laughs> where we live, what our histories are, unique information about us. Um, and we do it for good reason. That's not a criticism. But we live in a world now where suddenly this information has value for a lot of different purposes, not all of which are to ensure our health. And that's not good. And so I tell my healthcare teammates, don't think that this is a phenomena that just applies to the government or the military or these traditionally classified kinds of things. Whether it's you know, large insurance providers, you've seen two of the largest penetrated in the last year. Why? The individual is looking for personally identifiable information which they could then steal and use to generate follow-on cyber activity against individuals. That's all a commodity that generates value. So the idea that this is a short-term phenomenon that's just going to go away, I just don't see that. We're in a fight, and this is a fight that's going to go on for a long time. 
and doing more of the same and expecting different outcomes is just not gonna work to me. So we have got to figure out how are we collectively as a nation, as a society, gonna deal with this challenge. And we gotta do it in a way that recognizes we got a legal framework, and more than just a legal framework, and this is also true on the NSA side, I remind people, look, we are executing our missions within a representative democracy. That democracy has two important imperatives. One is to ensure the defense of the nation and its citizens and its interests. The other is that our very core as a nation is built around the idea that the power of the government will never be applied in a way that overrides the rights of us as individuals. Those are two imperatives that power us as a nation. We have got to figure out how are we gonna deal with the world around us, mindful that we've gotta meet both these imperatives. It's not one and it's not the other. Put another way, what I tell my own children, a world of great privacy, but little security concerns me as your father because I worry about your security and your long-term well-being. But a world of great security with limited freedom and privacy, as a citizen, I have no desire to be a part of. That's not the America that I think makes us what we are. And I don't think it's a case of, well, we gotta sacrifice one for the other. As we saw with the phone data, for example, hey, look, I believe that we can come to a common ground where we can meet both of these, both of these imperatives. And we can do it in a way that both ensures the security of the nation and also is mindful of the imperative of, look, we're not gonna become something we're not in the name of security. If we compromise who we are and what we are as a nation, I have always believed, and in my jobs, I never thought I was gonna be a four star, but earlier in my career when I worked for more senior people, I can remember um, telling it at one point when I was a captain, I was the special assistant, I was the thinker, if you will, for a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and I told him one day, um, we were just coming out of a meeting and we were trying to, f he, not me, he was trying to work his way along with the rest of the leadership about, so how are we going to deal with the world around us in a post 9-11 environment? And I turned to him and said, um, sir, I'll give you one thought. You take it for what it's worth. But if we fundamentally change who we are in the name of defending ourselves, then they have won because they'll have turned us into something we're not. And I'm just always mindful of that as a leader, never thinking that I was now going to be at the level where now I'm sitting at that table and saying, hey, I think we ought to be thinking about this. Hey, I think we need to be worried about that. You know, I don't want to compromise who we are, what we are. And with that, what questions do you have for me? Oh, we got a microphone on each side. Okay, I get the finger, it's over there. <laughs> so thank you for elaborating on some of the changes with the Patriot Act. So it definitely sounds like with the, now a increased or rigorous compliance structure, now having to go get data from the phone companies, and then the additional layers of approval, there could potentially maybe be some delays. So do you have any concerns for our national security on what those delays could do, and could they be detrimental so to So there's us? always trade-offs. I'm the first to acknowledge that one of the implications of the system we've created is that we're probably gonna be a little bit slower. What I said was, look, my job as the director of NSA is to talk about what are the implications, not to decide good or bad, right or wrong. So the input I gave was, my biggest concern is, I believe we need to continue to be able to access this data within a recognized framework, because I think the data generates value. It is not a silver bullet. It, I'd be the first and it drives me up the wall. I'm thinking to myself, if you've ever done intelligence work, it is like building a puzzle. You get hundreds of different data points and you bring them together to build a mosaic. What you see in the movies with the, aha, this is it. It happens occasionally, but it is not the norm. And most, most of this is just plain old hard work and trying to bring together a lot of different data points. 
So my first point was, I believe there's value and we should continue it. The second point I made was, but we've got to build a structure that enables us to access the data in a timely way. I said, I do not define timely as it's got to be within minutes or hours. But the flip side is, if it's weeks or months, that, that, that doesn't get us to value. That's not any good. So I said, look, as long as we can find something in the middle, for me, hey, I can live with that because I can still generate the value we need to help defend the nation. The other point that I think is another positive is there's a provision in under the current policy as the director of the National Security Agency, I had the authority to use um, my position to override the process and to grant access to the data. If I did that, I had to do two things. I had to inform the Attorney General of the United States that I had done it and why I did it, and I had to go to the FISA court and I had to inform the court that I did it and why I did it. And the court had to come back and tell me, do we agree or disagree, and can you use that rationale again? Um, in the last year, I've used that authority a handful of times. In each case, the court came back and said, we agree. Why? Because, for example, the court doesn't work 24-7. So in one scenario, when it's a Saturday morning about 01, and I'm back, and I'm going over, OK, wow, this really concerns me. And I'm looking at an ISIL threat that potentially has some domestic implications for this. We can't wait you know, three days for the court to open up. Um, in a couple of instances, I said, hey, I grant authority to access this. We had to meet the same standard. Um, and then I went back to the judge and informed the judge and the attorney general. In each case, they both came back to me and said, we understand the rationale. We agree with what you did and why you did it. Um, the, the current legislation that has been passed, it took the authority away from me, but it gave it to the attorney general. So the positive side for me is if there's an emergency situation, I can go to the attorney general and say, ma'am, um, we can't wait the couple of days this is going to take. We need to do this now. Here's why. And she has the authority, if she agrees with me, to authorize me to do it. And then same thing. We've got to go to the court and inform them about what we did and why we did it. Uh, we'll go over here next. Um, recently, there's been uh, some discussion about... So if you would, tell me your name. Oh, hi. I'm Scott. I'm Scott? with the urology department here. Hi. Um, recently, there's been some talk about... Um, we didn't get a shout-out for urology. I don't get no. that. No. <laughs> there was no shout-out for urology. That means people have been there then. <laughs> um, there, there's been some uh, talk about... Uh, putting in kind of backdoors or uh, weaknesses into uh, encryption software with the idea that uh, government agencies, maybe not your own, but others, FBI, local authorities, would be able to uh, access this. But there were concerns about, you know, these backdoors would be exploitable by, uh, you know, hostile nations. So what would your thoughts be on, you know, such backdoors might aid in certain government organizations getting a hold of this data, but also with you being tasked to, prevent, to protect uh, private industry uh, might weaken their encryption, making them more susceptible. So. so the first comment I would make is encryption is not inherently evil. I'm, I'm not a person who starts from a proposition that said encryption bad. That's not my viewpoint. The challenge that we're trying to deal with is, how do we come up with a mechanism that enables the government, using a legal framework, to access communications of concern to us? Now, interestingly, if you review the wiretapping laws, what the wiretapping laws say is that the phone providers of the United States must provide the technical means for the government to access phone content with a court order. That's law enforcement, not me. Domestically, that's FBI um, and local law enforcement. So our legal framework to date has been, in the telecommunications world, at least in phones, we've required providers to provide the means to access the phone call if there's a legal court order to do so. The, the question we're trying to come to grips with now is, as communications change, as we move away from the days of the copper wire and the nice switch, um, how do we create a mechanism that would provide the capability with a legal, within a legal framework 
to provide the government the means to access communications of concern. The challenge with encryption is the way it's done now is it's pretty much all or nothing. It either works or it doesn't work. Um, and so the discussion that you're hearing is largely a focus on collectively us, and it's an important discussion for us as a nation, trying to figure out what's the best way for us to do this. Is it to say there is no legal basis? We're comfortable with the idea, uh, criminal activity, terrorist activity, exploitation, whatever. It doesn't rise to the level where we're willing to supersede the inherent rights of our individuals to private phone calls. Um, again, that hasn't been the historic model, but the communications world around us is changing. And so we're trying to come to grips with what is the right answer? Is there a legal framework? I'm not one who's real enthusiastic about the word backdoor, about the phrase backdoor, because that implies to me you're trying to hide something and you're trying to do it surreptitiously. And I'm not interested in that. My job, my view would be, can't we come up with a structure that builds a public legal framework for how we're going to do this? and not hide. That's not what I think we want to do. But we're gonna have, this is something that's much bigger than the government. It's something for all of us collectively as a society to decide what are we comfortable with. So that's the thought, anyway. Ma'am. Admiral, my question is, uh, do I Tell me your name. My name is Sarah. Sarah, you're not a urology individual. I am not, I'm a recent okay. grad. Okay. <laughs> uh, my question is, do ISIS and other terrorist organizations have um, sophisticated cyber warfare capabilities, and if so, what are we doing to combat that? So, clearly, um, ISIL, like many entities around the world, is interested in increasing their cyber capabilities. You hear them talk, they've talked about this very publicly over the course of the last few months. It's something that we pay great attention to. Um, I apologize, but I'm not publicly going to get into the specifics of uh, their capabilities <laughs> so much. Um, but it's an area that we pay attention to. It's an area of concern. And clearly, they've been very public in their desire. And you've watched ISIL over the course of the last few months. Among the things you've seen them doing is um, at times claiming that they're able to penetrate systems to steal information to identify members of the government, members of the military by name, to post their name, their address, their information, and argue that ISIL individuals or like-minded individuals or groups should take action against these. And I mean, that concerns me. Mm. Sir. Sir, Bill Calderwood. Hey, Bill. I was in the Marine Corps four years. Semper Fi. I was in the first Harrier Squadron. All right. So I know a little bit about secrecy. I Do you still have your hearing? Harriers are among the bit. loudest uh, aircraft in, in the inventory. My question is, I guess, how much does the NSA and like the FBI and all the other groups work together be, uh, to monitor people in the military? Because it, it's amazing to me they're still letting people enlist in the military who have these weird ideas who are just going to turn around as soon as they get the chance and attack other military members. Mm -hmm. So um, this actually has came up in my confirmation hearing. And I, when I was asked this, I said the first point I would make is I'm a foreign intelligence. If confirmed, I'm gonna run a foreign intelligence organization. I don't collect against US persons. So the role of the NSA is not to monitor the, the military, the US military. They're not, don't get me wrong, there's a law enforcement and a criminal piece of that, but that's not NSA's job or NSA's mission. As a leader in the military, you know, clearly a topic of concern. We have seen several instances now Fort Hood probably being the most visible, where we actually had a DOD individual decide that he disagreed with what the military and more broadly the U.S. government was doing and brought a gun into a processing center and started shooting and killed multiple individuals, wounded multiple individuals, Major Hassan. You know, a phenomenon we just had not really seen before, but not unique to the military. You look at Boston, um, this... You look at the shooting in Texas, you know, two months ago. One of the phenomena we're seeing is, and you've heard Director Comey, the FBI, talk about this a good deal publicly. You're seeing increasingly a greater than historic number of individuals who seemingly believing that 
ISIL's vision of brutality and violence is something they want to embrace personally, um, starting to engage in attacks, trying to get to Syria to get training, which is a, clearly of concern to us as a nation, I would argue. And so the, the question gets to be, so what's the role of the government in trying to address that domestic issue? Is it a law enforcement issue? Is it an intelligence issue? How do we within the intel community coordinate with each other? Um, I would tell you, I, I've been an intelligence professional coming up on 30 years now. The coordination between us, man, has never been better. And the FBI is one of our best partners. Director Comey is a, an amazing leader. I mean, the FBI, I'm really proud to work with them. They're real professional. They're real good at what they do. So we're trying to work our way through this, but there's always that flip side. You know, do we want to get to the point? And I have the same thing, to be honest, when it comes to hiring at NSA. I'll get people at times tell me, well, shouldn't we come up with a means to identify the, the, you know, the future leakers of the world? Had we developed an employment test that asked you, so what's your view of the role of the government? Wouldn't that have been a way for us to weed out our friend in Hawaii? And part of me goes... Guys, be very leery of going down this road because there's a right for all of us to believe in what we believe. Where we draw the line is belief is one thing. Acting, violating the law, that's something totally different. And if you're going to take the law into your own hands, if you're going to violate the legal framework of the nation, I don't care what your political views are, it's illegal and it's unacceptable. That's where we kind of try to walk that fine line. So, sir. Hey, Sean. Dogs and beer. Um, All right. Where do you sell hot dogs and beer? Uh, not at the clinic. Don't worry, baby. Uh, <laughs> place, place called the Happy Dog. <laughs> it's, it's good. I thought um, you were going to tell me I'm in the urology wing. Yeah. <laughs> now, my question is, uh, you, you said the NSA has tens of thousands of employees. Um, it's got to have the facilities to analyze this data. Uh, for us as a society to do a real cost-benefit analysis on the amount of money that we're spending on security, we need to be able to have some evaluation on, on how effective that security is and a measure of, of whether that the marginal utility of that spend is, is measurable. Um, what can you do to provide some level of information for the general public to be able to weigh in on that debate on whether we spend that on security or whether we spend that on research and development or in other areas. Right, in other areas. In the military. Well, I make a couple points. So the first point I would make is, so how do we attempt to address that? In a representative democracy, our elected officials, acting as our representatives, execute that function under the current construct. They execute that function for all of us in the form of congressional oversight. So I sit down with, with the two primary congressional committees and go into great detail about what we're doing, where we're doing it, how we're doing it. I give them access to our systems. I give them access to our spaces, our facilities, our people. Um, I testify both publicly as well as in closed sessions with them. So publicly in the sense that it's a matter of public record and it's open to the citizens of the nation. Privately in the sense that it's closed classified hearing and they execute this function in our name. Which is also, and I'm going to riff for just a minute, it's an interesting challenge in the world we're living in now. Remember I talked about those abuses in the 60s and the 70s by elements of the intelligence community. In the aftermath of all that, again, I love history, um, in the mid-1970s, Congress chaired, the Senate chaired two, or chartered two commissions, the Church and the Pike Committees, to review how uh, intelligence organizations were being used and to try to answer the question, is there a different mechanism that we should put in place to address accountability and also get into, so is what you guys doing really of value to us and is it the best use of, of finite resources? Out of that congressional review came three tenets that we've taken for granted for the last 40 years. Number one, the creation of the FISA court in 1978. Number two, the creation of the Congressional Oversight Committees. Because the discussion at the time was, we want our citizens to have some level of awareness of what we do, 
But there is also an acknowledge that, acknowledgement that in doing that, we run the potential of compromising our very ability to do what we do. Because when it, once it becomes a, a matter of public knowledge, we watch the other guys change their behavior and try to evade our ability to, to gain insights. And I'm seeing that play out. And, you know, I've been a matter of public record saying, if you think the media leaks to the last 18 months have not impacted our ability to generate insights on targets around the world, particularly in the counterterrorism area, you don't know what you're talking about. Because I have watched targets change their behavior now as a result of what has been made public. Much of, what, much of, what, much of which has very little to do with this idea of privacy. Um, the second thing that came out of that effort in the late 1970s, or, so we talked about the court, we talked about congressional oversight. The third thing that came out of that was the idea that we need to create a legal framework over and above the court. And as a result of that, President Reagan in 1981 signed the first executive office order that specifically details how we do signals intelligence. Fast forward 40 years later, and now it's 2013. So the first thing we put in place was a court, except in the aftermath of media leaks, you had people saying, but this court only hears one side of the argument. It doesn't have an alternative representation or presentation of a counter argument. Yep, that's true. I'd argue same thing for you know grand jury, other constructs, but I think that's fair. Second thing that we ran into is, so Congress as our elected representatives acts as this oversight. What's the reputation of Congress in the world we're living in now? And I'm, I'm telling you the exact same thing I have told in my congressional oversight. The very mechanisms we put in place to engender trust in the world we live in today don't create that same level of trust. So the whole strategy that we counted on to help the American public to get to some of your question, hey, how should I feel about what you're doing? Tell me I ought to be comfortable with what you're doing. Tell me that there's somebody watching what you're doing that we could feel comfortable as a nation. So one of the challenges for us going forward is given the changes in the world around us, given the changes in the per perceptions we have as a society, how do we create an oversight and compliance structure that goes to your and other questions? How do we create something that engenders competence? The second part I would say to your question about, so how do we do that in the, in the near term at least, in addition to the oversight um, place, it isn't by chance that we haven't had a post 9-11 event in the United States to that magnitude in almost 15 years. Because it ain't from a lack of effort on the part of others. Um, you know, people often ask me, hey, what keeps you up awake at, what keeps you awake at night? The first thing I say is, to be honest, with the hours I'm working, I got no problem sleeping. <laughs> um, but the second thing I say is, just personally for me, I do not want another major terrorist event in the United States on my watch. I'm constantly pounding the team. We cannot let this happen again. Um, I don't want to see almost 3,000 people. I don't want to see anybody killed if we can do it. Um, and so it isn't perfect, but it isn't by chance that we haven't had a repeat. So. Admiral, thank you for being here. Great talk. Uh, I have a two-part question. Sure. How extensive and serious were the damages that came about by what Snowden did for us, they did for, against us? And secondly, would you give me in, or give us in layman's language this current situation where the uh, something extensive, I heard today, 18 million federal employees, hmm. past, present, and whatnot, that their records were uh, uh, hacked by the Chinese. How could that possibly happen? Uh, I, as a layman, I don't understand that. And what steps are being taken to that, make sure that doesn't be repeated? So you asked me like three really easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> if I could, let me try to get there. So the first question was, what's been the impact? Um, listen, folks, I'm not trying to overhype this. I always tell my team we have to be objective. We have to be very focused and very measured. I, I don't want to get into hyper, uh, hyperbole and over the top. But what I have said publicly is, as I have said a moment ago, there shouldn't be any doubt that I have watched targets that we work to defend this nation change their behaviors as a direct result of these revelations. And I have lost capability to generate insights as to what the heck they're doing that hasn't just happened casually. I mean, I'm watching Al-Qaeda training videos at times 
that are highlighting American media coverage about, hey, you don't want to use this phone. Hey, you don't want to use this, you know, capability because the Americans are inside of it. And I'm thinking, you have got to be kidding me. You know, what does this have to do with privacy? I'm talking about trying to work terrorist targets who, if they had their way, we wouldn't even exist. The very principles and tenets that we believe in as a nation, the rights of the individual, the, the right to express yourself as you see fit, to go where you want to go. ISIL and other groups, their vision of the world is 180 out for that. There's one answer, there's one way, and you conform or you die. This is a group that is burning people alive in cages that is publicly executing people. That when they take territory, and it's not that we haven't seen this before in history, but pulls out, so who's with the government? Who's with law enforcement? Who's with security in the military? Who's a teacher? Who's in the mayor's office? And cuts their head off to send the message to the town, you don't ever want, this is not our vision. There's one way and it's our way. So for those who would argue, well, this hasn't had any impact, I'm thinking you don't have a clue what you're talking about. Now, I'll leave it up to others to decide good, bad, right, or wrong. But we shouldn't pretend for one minute that this hasn't had an impact. So your second question about the OPM, um, an ongoing issue, so one I apologize, sir, I'm not going to get into a lot of specifics publicly about, but I will say this. Clearly, um, we are seeing a world in which data has become a commodity. And the United States government is one of the biggest holders of data in our nation, is an incredibly attractive target. And the same trends that we've seen in the private sector with major penetrations of medical insurance companies, for example, we're seeing them go after, we're seeing some of these same actors go after the same kind of data resident within the government. So clearly there is a responsibility on our part to ensure that the information that our citizens have provided us, just as for you as medical providers, there's a requirement to ensure that we are protecting that data. And so there's a series of steps ongoing to try to address that. As NSA and United States Cyber Command, we're, we're part of that effort. My mission day to day is defending the .mil or the DOD networks, not .gov or other areas in the government. Um, so I'm mindful that I need to remember what my role is, but I find myself now arguing we need to think about this differently. I just think we got to take a different approach here. And the, the other thing, and you saw, it, you saw it in the video, is one of my takeaways from my experience in cyber is that cyber is the ultimate team sport. If we think just the government's going to handle this, I don't see that. If we think just the private sector is going to handle this, I don't see that. We've got to bring the, the capabilities of both of these teams, government and the private sector, together to work this. Because there is no single technology, there's no single individual or organization, ah, there's a silver bullet. You just do this one thing and it'll fix everything. It doesn't exist. If it was that easy, we'd have fixed it a long time ago. There's a guy who's been focused on this now for almost a decade. Man, there ain't a single technical solution. And the other point I try to make to people is, this is about more than technology. At its heart, this is about how do you change cultures? How do you educate a workforce as to the fact that every single one of us operating a keyboard is now a potential source of vulnerability? And if you just take DOD as an example, we give everybody access to a keyboard because you can't do the job without it. Without connectivity, we can't execute our mission. And yet, if we, as we've given millions of people access, those are millions of potential points of vulnerability if we're not careful. And so a lot of this has to do with how do we educate our workforce? How do we educate our leadership? How do we change our cultural behaviors as to what is acceptable and what's not acceptable? So one of the analogies I use in the military is, we learned a long time ago that if you're, you're a sentry, you fall asleep, court martial offense. If you are a sentry, you discharge your weapon on post, court martial offense. We have taught ourselves, you know, ladies and gentlemen, there are just some things you do not do that fail to meet minimum professional standards and are unacceptable. And yet, we'll let one person click on a picture of a cat and download a virus that we will spend weeks 
dealing with spending at times millions of dollars and well it was just a nice picture of a cat I'm like come on and please I'm giving you a simplistic analogy but at times at times I'll go why did you click on the link how many times have we got to tell you that that's an intrusion vector well I wasn't thinking I was busy I'm just blowing through all my emails well, I got a gun with me all the time. I'm a guy, I'm in the army. I got a gun all the time. I didn't think it was a big deal to fire it. <laughs> hey, we, we managed to create a culture where people know that's unacceptable. You don't do that in the military. We got to create the same kind of culture and an expectation about behavior and the choices that we're all making as users. Because you can have the greatest defensive strategy in the world, but if you've got a non cooperative user base, it is largely, not totally, but it is largely negated. And there is nothing more frustrating for a defender than to have this great architecture with this multiple levels of protection and you get people clicking on pictures of cats. <laughs> uh, Ma'am. Good afternoon, Admiral. Afternoon. My name is Pat Horn. Hi, Pat. My question for you is what portion of the NSA's surveillance takes place in America versus overseas? We're a foreign intelligence organization in which it is illegal for us to conduct surveillance in the United States but against U.S. persons. Don't do it, ma'am. But when you go through the judge? Against U.S. persons, I can't legally do it. When I go to the judge, it's to get permission to collect overseas. Oh, okay. The only exception is when I go to the judge to say, hey, I want to look at a phone number. And that is such a small, small Man, it isn't even on one hand probably the total breadth of our effort, but it's the one that's gotten all the attention. Okay. We're not a domestic surveillance organization. So I don't track you as an individual. I don't monitor the contents of your phone as an individual. We don't do any of that. It's illegal. Thank you. But I'll still get people tell me, yeah, but you're listening to my phone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Toby. Mike, thank I want to thank you. <laughs> Mike, on behalf of all of us, I want to thank you for being here today and the information you shared with us. I also want to thank you for what you do for our country and the protection that you have uh, brought to us. I know that we have not had a major attack in the United States since 9-11, and I think you're no small part of it. No, no. And, I, I, and we that. greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me say one thing if I could. It, it's very kind of you to say that, but let there be no doubt in your mind. I am blessed to lead two organizations filled with men and women who are dedicated to the idea that our job is to defend the nation and to do it in a legal framework that protects the rights and the privacy of our citizens. I am motivated every day because I'm doing something I think that matters and because I do it within a framework that I am comfortable with as a citizen of this nation and because I work with men and women that I really respect, that I love being with. That's what keeps me going every day. So thank you very much, but this has nothing to do with me. Thanks, thanks, thanks. And let me thank you, all of you for being here today and just remind you that ideas to for tomorrow will continue in September. Marissa Mayer uh, will be here from Yahoo. Uh, she's the CEO there. And uh, the author, Jim Collins, from Good to Great, uh, will be here in December. I hope I'll see you all in the fall. Have a great summer.